Okay, so in the back of the room, I'm pre I'm you're seeing my presentation now. It 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 switched over properly. Okay. Depending upon where in the world you are, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good middle of the night, wherever wherever it may be. Um, my name is Aaron Gelfand, especially a number of the people in the room already know me. Um, I've been a LabVIEW developer since, or working with either National Instruments or Alliance members since 1998, so I've been doing this for just a little while. I'm a, as, as Fab mentioned, I have my certified LabVIEW architect certification, project management I have a small two-person Alliance shop here in town in Austin. Um, so I am definitely very local to everyone else around here. At NI Week this year, the Systems Engineering Group de de demoed and released a framework called the Configuration Editor Framework. I said, oh, cool, I want to try that. Now, I will say in advance of this presentation my history with some of the frameworks and reference designs that the Systems Engineering Group has released has been very spotty at best. There are some I've used to great effect, and there are some that I have used and said, what the heck. Um, that, and so this one, fortunately, is one of the ones that I'm like, ooh, cool. Now, that I'm not going to say as a 1.0 release that there haven't been some headaches, and I'll go over some of the headaches, but I'll also go into some of the bonus features I got out of this that I wasn't expecting and that really gave me some added flexibility and ways to get a bit of extras out that allowed me to, when working with the customer, say, oh, hey, I can do this in two minutes by a configuration file change rather than re redoing any of the code. Um, so there's definitely been some advantages to it, but it is not a tool, in my opinion, to be used in every case. The, it, like any tool in your toolbox, there are certain cases I think it would work well for in certain cases that I think it's just not well suited for and there's other options there. To begin with, for those of you who are local, um, you may be aware that my wife and I foster animals. Um, this right here is Honey. Honey is our 36th foster dog of this year and she actually gave us fosters 37 through 42. Um, they're all four weeks old right now. If anyone is looking for a dog, Honey is looking for her forever home. Um, in about, uh, about a month, month and a half. Um, she's a lab mix, or a shepherd mix, and is about, was about 45 pounds pregnant, so she's not a big shepherd. She is a relatively small shepherd. She is definitely a love bug and loves lying on your lap. So, what, are, what am I going to be talking about? Well, I'm going to be talking about what is the configuration editor framework, how, to, how you use the configuration edit, editor framework, my first impressions using it, as well as the end result of my utilization of it. The project that I was using it for is in its final stages, um, mostly because of delays on the customer side with hardware, so I can't say it's a released um, system as of yet, but it's pretty much we're just waiting on hard on all of our testing. So what is, this, what is the configuration editor framework? According to the NI website, it's a starting point for creating a custom configuration editor in the LabVIEW development environment. From my point of view, is it's a starting framework to provide a GUI and tree type data structure utilizing classes for creating the con configurations in an application. There's certain features it has, certain features it doesn't have, but the key of using configuration editor framework really is that it provides a front panel, it provides some cla pre-built classes that you need to inherit from and override, and the way, it's, the way it displays the data is in a tree structure, and so for those of you who have done a lot of work with tree controls in lab, you know how much fun they can be it does that part of it for you and you don't have to worry about it, which is always an advantage. So what do you get from the framework? You get a tree-based configuration structure and a GUI that allows for dynamic configuration abilities. The nice thing about this tree structure and the framework that they are giving you is that you define, you define what your nodes are and you can 
find different types of nodes, and you can say this node might be a child or a parent of other types of nodes, but you're not fixing how many of these nodes exist. And so if you have a project where you might need to instantiate a channel, and then all of a sudden you need five channels, and then, oh, no, now I need 50 channels, this gives you that. It gives you duplication capability. It gives you copy capability. It gives you the ability to remove and add the items. You define what can be a parent and what can be a child, but with, within that limitation, and you can have a, you can have, you can define it such that a child can actually be a child to multiple types of parents, so they can exist at different levels simultaneously. But that gives you a lot of actual, uh, gives you a lot of ability for dynamic systems where you don't know what all of your configuration is going to be and where it can change on the fly, even. What don't you get from the configuration editor framework? And th this, this was one of my gotchas. I, I expected some of this functionality to natively be there, and it wasn't. And that is pre-built save and load functionality, and I'll go into more details on that. You have to define the save and load functionality. And also, what is missing is the pre-built ability to recreate the tree from the data nodes. So when, as you build these structures, in the background, it creates the tree for you. It stores it in its own configuration, in its own private data configuration, but when you implement the save, you don't actually have that information. So when you pull it back from disk, you need to know how to recreate that. You need to write the code to recreate that data structure. And that, and that the saving it into the data structure, saving the data structure as a whole into what they call the repository, and the retrieval back from the repository and getting it to repopulate that tree took me probably 90% of my debug time getting it working properly. All the GUIs, everything else was easy. The, the save load and the to and from, as they call it, the to and from repo or repository, that's where I spent all of my, almost all of my debug time, and that was where all of my headaches were. Sorry, computer's being a little bit slow. So starting, starting with the CEF framework. So if you, haven't, if you haven't used this before, which I'm presuming most people in the room haven't, and except for the fact that, well, we've got a lot of NI people here who helped develop it, there's two, pe there's two classes that you need to know of and inherit from. There's the repository class. The repository is the master data structure that gets saved to disk or loaded from disk. A key to be aware of is that the repository does not automatically propagate data to the nodes, and the nodes do not automatically propagate data to the repository. The other thing you have is your node class. This is an implementation of what's going to be in your tree. You can have multiple, in, multiple different types of node classes. They can exist, and you can define that one may exist as a subset of another, or several can exist as a subset. And they, they all inherit back to the node tree, to the node, to the base node class. They may or may not inherit from each other. And my system I did actually uses both. I have what I call my, I have a system configuration, and I also have a product, uh, what I have is a abstract test class, and then I have individual tests within the test class. The system configuration and the, and the products both inherit from node, and then the test actually inherits from the abstract test class, which inherits from nodes. So it, you don't, it's, even though you look at the configuration editor and you might see different items on the tree, don't confuse the configuration tree that you're showing the user with the inheritance of the, of the nodes that you are creating. So an example hierarchy and this, this is the one for my system, is I created my system configuration repository, which is the repository class. I created a system configuration root, which is a node class object, a product, which is a node, node class object, a test, which is an abstract node, and then I had four subsets, four different types of tests. I had resistance tests, capacitance tests, high clock tests, and functional tests. And so on the right, you see 
I have my system configuration as my high-level tree object. I have two different types of dots, each having different types of tests. Now, one of the nice things with the tree controls is you get the ability to do glyphs. And the, the CEF does give you the ability as you create your different overrides that you can just say, hey, this is the name of my glyph. It has to be in a certain location on disk. But hey, they're already handling all the load and the load of that for you. One um, caveat with the initial release version is glyph name is case sensitive. And if you don't have the correct case, it doesn't load the glyph, but it also doesn't give you any sort of an error telling you it hasn't loaded the glyph. And that one is fixed. As I said, I've been reporting a lot of these to Benji, who's right here in the front. And I've probably given him two, three, four dozen different items, most of which, which are fixed in a, new, which, in a release that has got, went live, I think, in the last week. Um, I haven't incorporated the fix into my code because, as I said, I'm more or less at release. I'm not, I'm not risking the changes at this point. So here's an example hierarchy of my project. Now, I went with... I went with the CEF to see how much it gained me as a, hey, this is, this is a new tool. I like how it looks. I like what I thought it gained. But one thing that hadn't been clear on my project when I started it is that I actually had two different types of dots to actually test. The tester that I'm replacing is a multi-decades old tester. It's all custom PCBs. I've had to reverse engineer all the test sets by the schematic of the tester, which in and of itself was reverse engineered by one of the customers from the PCBs themselves. It, 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 it's, it, 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 it's been fun, but what, what had happened was some point along the line, you know, a decade, two decades ago, they came up with a second type of dust. And rather than building an entirely new type of tester, they modified the panel so that they have these panels that the ducts connect into. And they modified the panel that they could plug a new one in, and all of a sudden there's a second dot which isn't in any of my documentation. Well, guess what? I already had my product as a class, and the framework gave me the ability to go ahead and just say, hey, two, two different products instead of one. And I got that for free with, minimal, with next to no code changes. So that was one of the lovely surprises coming out of my use of the configuration editor framework. Fab, you have a question? Yeah, I had a comment. I know for these uh, crowds, everybody knows that the dots is signed under test. Just in case okay. So, 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 so for those of you who may not have heard the term DUT before, DUT stands for device under test. It's also called unit under test and about a half dozen other terms. It's basically whatever the heck it is we're testing with the system. So let's take a look at what the configurator actually looks like when, it, when you start inserting its subpanels. At the top level, I created my system configuration node. This is information that is generic to my test system. Basically, this is a list of all my Visa and IV references. So I have an external HIPOT tester. I have what COM port is it on? I have a NI4138 SMU. I have the DC power handle for the SMU. I have my, AI, my analog input and analog output DAC MX tasks. And then I have a couple of IV references for my switches. So that's what my system looks like at the system config node level. What instruments am I talking to? What are their valid handles? Then I have the product, I have the product node level. I create the pro at the product level, I basically name and part number. <laughs> when the tests are actually running, I, I'm not going to get, I'm, so when the tests are actually running, the user gets a prompt at, to scan the pro uh, product number off of their work travelers. And yes, you can choose to use controls other than silver. Um, if you want to replace the tree control with a non-silver tree control, go ahead. Um, since, they hit, since the configuration editor already started with, tree with the silver controls, I continued their use in my code in some places and not others. So 
So then an example of one of my resistance tests. Now, remember I said I created an abstract test class, which was intended as an abstract. At the test class level, I defined certain data structures, basically test name, un the units, the test li and the test limits, both up upper and lower limits. Everything else for my tests are specific to the tests. Now, the framework at this point in time doesn't sort of support doing multiple subpanels, subpanels within subpanels for this sort of circumstance. So I, I just went ahead and duplicated the code for the whopping four controls across my four different GUIs. Um, I could have also just put that functionality into an X control if I wanted, but for responding on an event structure to four different value changes, I just went ahead and did my code. So then for resistance tests, well, in, in my case, resistance test is using an SMU, set it to current mode output, what current, what is the current range, what is the voltage limit, what is the voltage limit range, and am I doing two wire or four wire? Then, last but not least, I have my switch settings. I have a switch mapping algorithm that the DUT has four types, has two different connectors, connector P1 and connector P2. Each connector has four types of pins. And so I have the ability to map it and tell it which t pins are being used for a particular test. So let's talk about some of the nitty gritty of the configuration editor framework. We said we have our repository class. The repository class has a number of overrides that you have to do. You know, that's what one of the things with classes. You define, hey, you need to override this or you don't have to override it. With the repository, you have to define your open, which is your load from disk, as well as your save, which is your write to disk. This takes the repository and saves it to disk and reads it back from disk, but there's actually, by default, nothing in the repository itself. It doesn't have any data types defined. You have to determine what is in the repository, and that's where your read tree and write tree comes from. Your read tree will iterate through the current, your current array of nodes to copy them somehow into the repository. You, you define how they're cop being copied and stored, and the write tree is just the opposite. The, the read tree, write tree, <coughs> along with two of the additional um, nodes that we'll see, or two of the additional overrides we'll see when I talk about the nodes, are where I spent the vast majority of my time. So, node overrides. There are no required overrides per se for node, class, for node classes. Um, if you don't do any overrides, you're not going to have any real functionality. So that's why I do have the required in this slide in quotes is that the node class is not enforcing overrides. But if you don't do at least these, you're not getting any real functionality out of your node. So to repo and from repo, in conjunction with the to tree, from tree, these four VIs, or these four sets of VIs, I should say, the, the two for read tree, load, read tree, load, um, write tree, and the two repo from repo, which have to be done on a class for class basis, is where 99% of my headaches and hard to do issues came from. Those are the places you have to worry about. Edit options VI. Um, this, VI this VI is really only needed if you have children but it's useful regardless. This VI uh, is where you tell it, hey, here are the following items that can be children in my tree. And this is also where you can specify, do you allow edit, copy, duplicate type functionality. Get text VI is where you tell it, here is how it's showing up in my tree. UI reference VI, your, your UIs are done as subpanels, and so, this is the, is the static VI reference that you need to point to your node UI VI. Now, I will say one of the things that I hadn't originally realized is node UI.VI was available for overriding. So every one of my sub every one of my nodes for my test classes, and actually for all my nodes, 
has a different name for its GUI um, than NodeUI.vi. I hadn't even realized that that one was a override, and I'm just like, okay, they're giving me UI ref to override, and I didn't realize they were also giving me the UI itself. So first impressions using configuration editor framework. This is my bad stuff part one. Um, th these are some of the things that I don't like about the current implementation, a number of which have already been fixed. The configuration GUI was intended for standalone use. It wasn't intended as a sub VI where you could, you know, launch it from, you know, if you had a uh, runtime menu, you could do, you know, configuration edit menu. And so it will actually exit lab view if you're in, if you're in an EXE. So w when I was building my EXE and running some tests, at one point I had had a valid configuration. At one point I went in and said I'm going to make some changes, and kaboom, exited, and there went my entire program. Oops. Um, there, there's no error in, error out to make it easier to call as a sub-VI. Um, and all the error handling is dial right now is dialogue-based. So you're going to get pop-ups. There, I, th this is something I personally really do not like um, because you can, you can be hanging your code without realizing it. Getting the to and from repo working took way too long in my opinion to the extent that there is an under the hood data structure that is keeping track of, it's creating an array of nodes, it's actually maintaining w what it's it knows that node one is my parent. Node two, three, and four are children of each other. It knows how it's recreating it. I can't use it to just go ahead and say save that structure and load that structure as defaults, and instead I have to, I have to do all that via overrides to rebuild the structure. So that's something that I think should be native ability that isn't. And that's, admittedly, that's my opinion. Others may have other opinion on that. Um, a bunch of the dialogues for file save, file uh, automatically XML. Can whoever just they assume they they're they're hard coded right now, so you have to go in and find where they are in the various um, state machine state machines in order to change that. Um, that, and that's fixed too. Um, as I said, I've been providing feedback. They've been lovely about working on the feedback. Um, also, it, the instantiation is, as it is right now is not quite yet a framework. If you go in and say create new project, it's building a project for you, and then you're having to hunt and peck and replace a couple of constants for, for your system. When you create your repo override class, you're having to replace a number of those, delete all of the example code nodes that they sent that they actually instantiate for you. So it really is more of a sample project and not more of a framework like, you know, Norm, I've used your ESF tool quite a lot, and that's something I'd like to see the instantiation become more of. Name my config class give it an optional array of class names, and let it instantiate it for me. Um, I also dislike that there's no native save loadability to create the nodes in the tree structures. I've already talked about You have to be a little bit careful with um, building EXEs. Um, there are discussions on this on the forum page, um, and you have except what I had to do, I couldn't get these instructions on the forum page working, so what I ended up doing was just modify the, modifying the path to look inside the EXE um, and not worry about external loads because all of a sudden my compile times went from, you know, one to two minutes on the EXE to 15 and then was failing because it was trying to pull in a lot of other LabVIEW libraries because you don't want to disconnect type defs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so good stuff. As, as I said, this is one of this. Whereas there have been a couple of ones that I'm like, I'm never touching this again. Um, this one, I'm I'm very happy to touch again. Um, it was very flexible in terms of the data structures. It's very flexible for systems that have dynamic configuration needs. It's probably overkill 
for some of the systems where you just need, you know, here's a list of items that's, that's going to be fixed. The bonus, out of, one of the bonuses out of this was it was very easy to create a dynamic test sequencing engine out of my data structure. I, mo I modified my test class to have a VI that I require the children to override called run test. And hey, I've got all of these individual tests that now by getting, by getting my list of tests that are under a particular product, I now have a dynamic test sequencing engine. And the double bonus was that, as I mentioned, you know, this test system isn't really well defined. It's not really well configured. But one of the neat things that they actually did have was they have four calibration ducts. There's two ducts that are defined to pass, at one on the high side, one on the low, and there's two designed to fail, one too high and one too low. Well, we also found that at least one of those calibration ducts was broken as I was trying to validate my test system. And it's, so the, they're supposed to be tested against the normal test limits and pass and fail, but what about making sure that the calibration boxes themselves are good per the test system? I don't have to make any code changes. All I have to do is assign four new product numbers to those calibration boxes, and I can run the same test with different limits to make sure that the calibration boxes themselves are actually met, are actually still in calibration and have been reassembled properly. Wait, how did the configuration framework, the configuration thing, make that easy? Because you could write click on something and say, create So. Oh, so the, 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 the question from the back of the room was, how did this make it easy? And the answer is in this dynamic, a lot of that is in this dynamic test engine I was able to recreate. And so for the, on the screen, you can see here I load my system configuration from my, this is basically my loading from my repository. I look, I get my list of products, and I look up my product by the part number. So now I've been able to, instead of having two part numbers, I had six part numbers, four, four for two for the two different types of dust, and one each for the four different types of calibration boxes. So all I'm doing is looking up a new product definition in my configuration. And then, as I said, I have my run test, which I'm able to iterate through. And so I have a dynamic test sequence engine, so one of my ducts needs nine tests, one of my ducks only needs seven. Um, and if I, when, I was, when I was doing debug work on this, I was able to just instantiate a single test at a time or a combination of tests and work my way through it all dynamically without with being config files without actually being, have, requiring any code changes. And so that's something I really liked coming out of my use of this. So um, the version I was working with really was a 1.0 release. Um, I found a lot of typos, um, cert certain other fixes. Um, as I said, the team has been active in fixing those, so there is a new release up. The, the configuration editor framework is not appropriate for all projects. Um, as I said, if you're just if you have a relatively small configuration that's static, doesn't require dynamic changes. I think it might be overkill in, in, its, in its current form factor, um, but I do look forward to using this again. So a couple extra items is additional resources. Um, in there's an example program up on the web. Also, this is on, Git on GitHub, so you can make and submit changes. Um, and there's a CF forum page. Um, I probably will, after I'm out of the deluge of projects I currently am, start looking at making some submissions myself. Any questions? Or the back. Have you uh, foreseen that your tree, the way that you've got it architected, is going to uh, get deeper in terms of uh, plantations right now? It's like pretty much what, three levels on the tree. So, so, so for, for my particular, for my for this particular system, I only need to go three levels deep. I have my, uh, I have my system configuration level, which is all of my instrument references. 
I have, I have multiple products and each product can have multiple tests. So here's an example of all nine tests. Right now I only have one product. And if I want to just go ahead and duplicate this guy, I can go ahead, you know, change his name, change the part number, oops, you know, get rid of, remove a test, duplicate the test. And, you know, I save this and I have a new, an entirely new test sequence. I can rearrange the order of the nodes. And so this really worked well for my particular application. There was just a question of how deep can you go or how much nesting. Um, I have, this is as deep as I've gone. I don't know that there's any limits since you're responsible for being able to recreate the tree and save the tree. You might have some issues um, in recreating certain items, but I don't, I don't know if the tree control itself natively has any limits to the number of levels it can have. Fabiola? Yeah, there's two questions uh, here. It's more the, the, the question from Ravi, the nesting was more of the loading phase time. Uh, so uh, um, in terms of the actual time it takes to execute or in terms of how much many hours I personally spent trying to get that portion working? No, I think it's loading and saying, like, actually how long. Because it, you're reading a configuration. It, it's, it's, it, I have not noticed, I mean, it's not a huge data structure for me. I have not noticed, and I haven't benchmarked it, but it's seconds, if, if not, if less than that. The other question where... Um, so from from my perspective of what are the use cases for the framework, I would say the use case is any configuration where you need the ability to di to have dynamic number of channels, items, products, if you want a dynamic configuration rather than a static configuration where you always have a number of fixed items. That is my personal opinion. Benji, do you want to amplify? I would say in general, anything that you will use two tables or two Excel sheets to configure, this will be a good fit. If it's smaller than that, it might be too big. It will also depend on how the user is going to interact with it. Because one of the nice things of using these against just uh, working with Excel or with a TXT file, is that in here you can add rules or protect the input for the system. So you can even validate the configuration is good even before runtime. So what what ben, what Benjamin just said is that for in the in the people who wrote this opinion is it's where you have multiple text files or multiple sheets in an Excel file or multiple Excel files. An advantage the framework offers also is that you have the ability to protect the data, make sure configurations are valid, limit inputs, outputs, et cetera. Fabiola, another? Yeah, the, the other remote question was, um, why would you do this and not test them? What do you so, mean by not test them? Test the product, test the stand, national research. Oh. <clears throat> so, there, there, there's a lot of cases where test stand is overkill. Um, and, you know, they were originally when I started this project, it was, okay, we have, we have seven tests, or actually nine tests, um, four, four different types of tests, and that's it. The, the system has been running for 20 years, more or less unchanged, but a lot of the chips that are in the system haven't been manufactured in the last decade. So they've been having a lot of problems with maintaining the system. They're ne they're, generally speaking, they're never going to change the number of tests. They're not going to change the system. Using test stand as a test sequencing engine is overkill. So that's why I did not consider test stand for this. Well, the,
want to be generic enough to use across different systems. So this has been a really good starting point for that. Okay. You might want to Okay. So I'm sorry I'm blanking on your name. Sure. Bert. So what Bert just said was that they've been using this a lot on embedded systems where they want to be able to dynamically configure them, test them, validate proper configurations, but not have to constantly rebuild the RT EXE. Yeah, the answer to that is yes, I do have experience with having to save and add fields and change fields. And what I did under the hood was because all of these inherit back to the node class, I just simply, my, my save and load is creating an array of nodes and just using LabVIEW's XML, no, class to XML functionality to dump it out to disk so that because everything is classed, LabVIEW will, if I make changes to my class, LabVIEW knows how to interpret that. And so I did have to make a couple of changes during debug and I was able to recover all my existing configurations. Now, if, if you were using different data types, that might not work so well. So what was also said was that the NI team also has experience and what they did rather than just using the class functionality, the class to XML functionality that I did, they have their own interpreters and they built in the ability to interpret older versions into their code. Their code in a number of ways is similar to Stephen Mercer's aka Aristos Q um, character delineator. Any additional questions? I don't think it I, I I don't think that I don't know that it was wrapped up in such a way to just give you those tree the tree manipulation functions outside of the configuration it's utility. Not in here. It's, it's an old So basically the framework, one of the classes that we have on top is a tree class. And it has all of the functions that you were going to be using. So you can call that. A lot of that was in the tree palette that Darren showed us last. But here I'm writing manually the functions. But yeah, it helps a lot. So basically just with that class and the tree structure, and I mean the case structure we have, you can just take that outside of the framework and use it anywhere and you'll get basically the same functionality. So the, the question was, can, can you steal that tree functionality for other uses? And the answer was a lot of the tree manipulation was done in a class, so you can steal that class and, and reuse it outside of the configuration editor framework to get some assistance in working with the notoriously difficult tree controls. And all the rest of it is just the tree control. Uh, I don't know of any situation where you want to have a tree control, but not want to have a fly with all the elements. And so it ends up basically being not a configuration of your framework, but a tree framework. So there was an additional comment that I'm not going to bother <laughs> trying to repeat. <laughs> <laughs> so um, final thing is, as I mentioned earlier, we do have also, the six pups looking for their forever homes, um, in addition to Mama. 
Um, the pups are four weeks today. Um, One, one final thing, and this really only applies to the folks here in Austin, specifically the handful or less than a handful of people that are the local freelancers. Um, if any of you have some availability over the next two to three to four weeks, I do have one of my local customers who does not get, does not, has too much work for what I can give him and is looking for additional freelancers. So please speak to me afterwards because um, he, I've been calling around and haven't found anyone for him yet. So if any of you do have availability, availability over the next couple of weeks, let me know. <laughs> Was there an additional comment? I just, no, I just, I just tried to type that comment. Oh, he would have So, Bob, since we've switched over to him being the presenter, do you just want me Right now we need to do the 
Uh, to the microphone, if you can unmute your audio so we can see, we can hear you, that would be great. You should be able to hear me now. Oh, perfect. Okay, now let me ask the audience at home if they can hear us. Can everyone hear H? Hello. Yes, we can. We can hear you. <laughs> yes. Perfect. David, you're supposed to be muted. I guess, well, I guess it's a break, so I guess you guys could unmute yourselves as long as you mute yourselves back when you're... Yeah. <laughs> We're all singing to ourselves here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I put there, if you guys have any um, any questions or any feedback or any complaints or anything, just send me an email. Hopefully, hopefully you guys are liking this. So how are you going to try to do the, the video, Nate? Oh, I'm not. I thought you had a plan for video. It's fine. No, so so yeah, no. So what I was what I was saying is the only thing I could think of was to go to the Skype window and then and then kind of like start maybe a video com uh, conference with me and and that would show maybe, yeah. but I don't know if that would work. Yeah. So. <clears throat> you have two audio sessions and have to mute one. It may not allow. Yeah, that. that's probably gonna be gonna be tough. I guess we're going to tell uh, Six Clear to find another tool so we can have. <laughs> yeah, it's all Six Clear's fault. <laughs> or I don't know if there's, yeah, I don't know if there's a, a, a tool to just show your video camera from the control panel. Doesn't seem like Join Me has that. No, not Join Me, the. Um, your Windows control panel. I don't know if you have access to your camera from there. And I, I, like my old Dell used to have a little app where you could run the video without actually using it in an application. Oh, and then share it. Oh, then, okay. Yeah, I like, mean, like then, on my screen. Yeah. Let me see. Can you see my slide right now? Okay, I see your slide. I see some thoughts about accessor methods, and it is the slideshow view. It's not the presenter's uh -huh. view. Oh, that's what I can see. Okay, two more if minutes. If I do that, do you see me that way? Yeah, I can see you. That's exactly what I was talking about, but I don't know if you oh, okay. know how it's not going to be working. I guess if you if you start talking with your hands and you need us to see you, you can bring it back. <laughs> yeah, the window's kind of big. I don't know if I have a smaller window of that or not. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if there's anything on the control panel or a video. I don't know. How 
many people do you have there? So over here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 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 five, six
And the, the way this works is uh, you can either go to this website. If you're out of the country, you might need to use the website. Um, and there's a form there. Or uh, in, in the US, you should be able to text any of these numbers to this number. And uh, the results will hopefully show up live. So what's your favorite thing about using LabVIEW? This is just kind of our icebreaker and make sure everybody knows how to use the tools. And let me know when we have a few responses. So the pretty colors, no semicolons. It's self-documenting, and LabVIEW gives you plenty of opportunity to go get some coffee. All right. Those two running pretty close. So definitely we all like that LabVIEW is light on the syntax, right? No semicolons to snag your clothes on. And of course, self-documenting is a tongue-in-cheek. Let's go ahead and move on. Um, glad to see that the tool is working. I've never used that plugin before. It's a pretty neat. It plugs directly into PowerPoint. Um, so some very basics, object-oriented programming 101. Just because we have to motivate this presentation, or otherwise it's going to be like, why are we talking about this? So if someone can answer for me this question, what would you say are the main features provided by OOP compared to procedural programming? If you can relay answers, Fabiola. Encapsulation. Dynamic dispatch. Encapsulation, dynamic dispatch. All right, those are both very good. and. Uh, I'll go ahead and move forward with that. Um, encapsulation and inheritance, which you get through dynamic, dis or dynamic dispatch, you get through inheritance. Um, so someone give me a, a succinct definition of encapsulation. And uh, I'm hearkening back to a Chris Salina forum that came out recently. Functional containments of data and functionality. Functional containment. That's good. I like that answer. I'll just see if there's any other answers before I move on. You define the intention and hide your uh, implementation. I heard part of that. Define intention and hide implementation. Okay. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to go forward with uh, this idea of encapsulation as um, an abstraction. I, I forget the exact word the first answer used, but what what are I, I think the second answer kind of lends itself to this question. You know, what are some of the benefits you get of encapsulation? Anybody else want to try to answer that? Easier to debug, yes. Okay, uh, Ernesto said data protection and hiding. Right, hides the, the details of how the data is implemented. So this is a uh, illustration that I think I stole from Stephen Mercer probably back around 8-2 when he was traveling around talking about how great OOP is going to be. And uh, inside the circle we have our private data of some class, some object that's going to go on a wire probably through a shift register and bounce through some, some VIs that are going to utilize that data. But in order for them to get access to that data they have to invoke methods, right? There's no direct access to that private data. Or if you have a global data or um, data that's being accessed in parallel, then each method, each VI may be running independently, but it still has to get access to that data through those methods. So the, the methods are providing uh, containment around that data. And the word I like to use is it abstracts the details of how that data is stored, that data structure from the consumers, 
from those VI one, two, three, four. And uh, the answers you gave about debugging, um, that's good. Um, it also allows you to uh, refactor your implementation, those, those data structure details without affecting your callers. Um, it allows you to control the data going in and out of the object. So if you want to do sanity checking on your input values or um, if you need to make sure that your output values follow some constraints, then you can do that in those methods. And just a phrase that I like to advocate is that all data should be private until proven otherwise. And that's kind of similar to the uh, judicial system, right, where it's uh, in a court of law, a suspect is innocent until proven guilty. Well, we want to try to uh, keep our data private and think really hard about, you know, is there any reason that I need to uh, make it not private? So we all know those things. But when we start talking about accessor methods, uh, I say that we start to break some of those rules. And that's unfortunate because the LabVIEW IDE makes it very easy to break those rules, right? You can select a, a, you know, a bunch of um, variables in that uh, little create method box, dialog box, and say create accessories for all of them. Read and write, sure, why not? And so you start to uh, break down that, that nice encapsulation, that abstraction that you've started out with right from the get-go. And so I've I've drawn you know these red A's on top of these methods. Um, an accessor is a method, but it kind of destroys the purpose of the method. Um, and the implementation of those auto-generated accessor methods you're very well familiar with. I've just shrunk them down here to fit. But you know we see that the the data type on the terminal uh, is obviously going to exactly match the data type in your private data. And um, I, I know that you can modify these um, private are these auto-generated accessor methods, and they don't have to follow that same contract. But I think that if I'm looking at somebody's code, and especially if it's called within a property node, um, to me it's almost like uh, it's it's in, impolite, inconsiderate to to dump code into something that, by all intents and purposes, looks and feels like it was auto-generated, and I expect that one-to-one -one input output. And so I'm calling this my gentleman's agreement that when you auto-generate code unless there's a really strong reason to that you probably shouldn't be adding code to those auto-generated methods. Um, but accessor methods in general, you know, they start they uh, they break down that encapsulation because generally accessors are public, so everybody has direct access to your data. Um, it starts to expose the structure of the data, which can make refactoring harder in the future. Um, it forfeits that control that you had previously with methods for the data going in and out. And uh, just as an aside note, I'm going to talk about references from time to time. And any accessor method that returns a reference are the worst offenders. Um, and we'll go into more detail about that, but just keep that in mind. Uh, it's, and they're the worst offenders because it allows the clients to modify that data anywhere at any time outside of data flow, outside of your method calls. Uh, so it's the direct access to your private data if you're handing out references. Nate, I think you need to be a little bit... Uh, <laughs> Was there a comment there? I couldn't hear it. Oh, so you may, you may point the, the last line on your slide. You're going to have to repeat, Fabiola. I can't hear it. Go ahead and move on. All right. I'm cranking up my volume now. All right, so speaking of that gentleman's agreement, our next poll is, do you find yourself inserting code into your auto-generated accessor methods? If you're struggling between answering between frequently and rarely, then I would suggest to you that you probably want to say frequently. Nate, is there 
Nate, is there a reason that you're specifically saying auto-generated accessor method? Um, no. I mean, yes, you could create accessor methods manually and then mark them as an accessor folder or whatever, the property folder or whatever. But uh, I guess I just assumed that if people were going to be making straight pass-through methods that they would be using the auto-generated technique. So one of the questions, uh, one of the questions in the room was that if they modify that auto-generated with instead of using the unbundle, using in place structure, if you are counting that as modifying it. No, because the behavior is still the same. You haven't changed any details there. So this is a pretty interesting poll. Um, I'd love to hear from those that said frequently what their cases are. And I can I can speak ahead of time and say that uh, if you're trying to emulate a hardware driver that is normally setting capability like uh, Visa parameters of some type, then I can see where you would might follow along in that line where your um, your property when you use a property node it's actually doing a you know a Visa write of some type. Then I can I can see where that would be useful. Um, anybody have any comments on? Other times when they find this really useful. One, one thing that I found particularly useful is uh, inserting fake caching code. Uh, just having like a dirty bit inside um, uh, attached to each one of these uh, uh, properties. So the use case okay. was starting caching. Uh, like mm -hmm. a caching. Okay, like fake caching. Dirty, dirty bit uh, as to whether it's been set or read or. Mm. Yep. The other one, uh, similar to the idea of. Caching, yeah, letting the parent get a like a flat copy or whatever just came into it for whatever reason. Did you hear that one? A flattened copy, that's all I got. Into the parent, particular. Flattened copy into the parent. Into the parent data. You're writing flattened data into the parent data? Yeah. Okay. I probably need to see that some more. I like the dirty bit idea. Um, I'm going to go on to talk more about, you know, whether, you know, when it's appropriate to be to have write accessors or not. Um, so let's maybe come back to that. Um, there was a question on there was a question on the um, chat box about are we talking about property nodes or accessor methods? And um, you kind of jumped the gun there a little bit. I I I. I I would say either in the sense that, you know, from this view, I expect the same behavior basically, um, but more so with the property node. I mean, because when it's a sub VI call, yeah, I recognize the sub VI call. I'm probably going to open it up anyway because it's easy to do so and maybe there's some code there. Um, but when it's a, when it's wrapped up into a property node call, it's, it's a little bit more effort um, to get into to see the detail. And I don't think of it as a proper, I don't think of it as a sub VI call, I think of it as a property, you know, like, um, just like a VI server property that can't be opened. Um, but we'll talk more about uh, the evils of property nodes in a second. And I, I, I hate to say that because uh, this slide is to show that I actually like the, the consolidation of multiple properties into a single property node. You know, imagine if you're trying to set 10 properties and you have this long string of VIs that essentially do nothing, but it takes a lot of screen real space to do that. And yeah, you could create another method just to set properties and then have a hairy connector pane. And actually, we'll talk about more of that later. But um, yeah, so there's definitely convenience to, to collapsing that into a single um, property call. Um, yep. Talking about the gentleman's rule, uh, I think it feels like you're making a case against what you're trying to make a case for. If I'm dealing with a property node in a class, it's really, really abstracting whatever's going on, and it means that I really don't know what's going on with the class or inside the class. So why would um, the property node syntax itself almost make you feel like you're really, really setting a data value inside the class itself. I don't know. I, for me, it feels the opposite. I guess I want to get more info from you. 
you. Well, first and foremost, I, I think that we shouldn't be creating properties unless we need to provide that access, which in the case of a parent class makes sense to have a protected right accessor. But I think we all too often just create write and read accessors uh, out of convenience rather than thinking about what the the proper method really should be that that is using that data you know a, a newbie's uh, tendency when they're first coming to uh, coming to live uh, object oriented programming is uh, they'll treat the object like a cluster and they'll have a set of accessor reads that pull the data out and then operate on it and then a set of accessor writes that write the data back into the object. And that's that's definitely you know the worst case abuse of, of a ca encapsulation. But even even beyond that, I think that some of us, even as CLAs, sometimes we just feel a little bit lazy and we, we want to make it easy to you know, poke a value in and a write accessor is a good way to do that. Um, so what about, they, sorry, go ahead. Or the convenient way to do that. I shouldn't say the right way to do that. But but more often than not, I think that there's probably a better method to um, handle that data than to just have direct access to it with an accessor. So what about uh, the practice of generate auto generating the accessors via property nodes and marking them immediately as private, like like what you were saying earlier? So the default is all these accessors are private until proven. Yeah, my first statement was all data should be remain private, but I think that private accessors um, can be useful. I think that more than likely protected accessors is what you're looking for, yeah. because within the within a within the scope of the class itself, you can always just use the bundle and unbundle node, and then mm -hmm. you don't have to you don't have to create an accessor at all. Yes. Well, this, one thing about that Nate, though, is if you're dealing with parent information, that is being the caveat to that is that there's ever an intent. To extend your class, I found along those lines, I'd go down the line, oh, I'm bundling, unbundling, bundling, unbundling, only to realize I need to extend them like crap, and I got to create all those accessors along the way yeah. so that my children can have easier access yeah. to me. Yeah, so that's why, that's, that's, that's actually why I now create the accessors and make them private. And then until I find out that I need to override them, uh, then I make, or that they need to be accessed within the family, I make them protected. Mm -hmm. And then I slap myself if I have to make them public. That's that's good discipline. Um, just to <laughs> just to try to minimize VI count uh, or partially try to minimize VI count, I I prefer to stick with bundles until that doesn't work, and then I'll create you know the protected method in order for a child class or protected accessor in order for this child class to be able to operate on what it needs. The problem then is searching for where you're bundling and unbundling. Now you have to do a search for text. Where if you do a method from the beginning, a VI, it's a lot easier to do find all instances of this VI. So that's yeah, I why I err for the. And if you do a search for a property node for the, uh, the 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 VI that implements the code for the property node, it will find all the all the property nodes where it's being used. So right. It, uh, it's a lot easier to find. Now, yeah. I, oh, I, yeah. I hear that a lot too. You know, well, it's nice to have everything wrapped up into an accessor so that I can search for it or add debugging breakpoints and whatnot. And this, as far as the searching thing, I find that the text search capability is pretty nice if you take the time to go into the advanced find and uncheck and check the right options and pop, you know, possibly add some regular expression syntax or whatnot. I, I can, to me, the, this, the text search is sufficient. I don't have to right click on, say, um, find all instances. So Darren Nettinger in the back is shaking his head. I am shaking my head, and then Norm is shaking his head as yes. So Darren and I are saying no, and Norm is saying yes. So. One other quick note. I don't know how much more he's going to spend. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much more time uh, he's going to spend on this one. And a nice uh, added benefit of the property node access is that you can use the DVR of that class and get the exact same property node. Yep. So Oh, of course. All right, let's move ahead. We're not getting through this fast enough. <laughs> Comments are good. I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. But anyway, uh, I was going to say that uh, we also know that there's you know a downside of using uh, property nodes that you know, sometimes you have to relink them for whatever reason, 
Um, so the question uh, here is, you know, do you call accessor methods and property nodes? Um, I know Jack Dunaway put a pretty strong post out there saying, no, never, don't do that. The, the bottom option, I, I should explain, in order to call a method uh, through a property node, it has to have error clusters. And so some people, as a form of optimization, they, uh, they, they'll they remove the error clusters or at least remove the error case and wire the error cluster through. But I can see that as being one reason why someone wouldn't want to use them in a property node. All right. So most people do use them. That's pretty much what I would expect. I use them quite a bit too. They are convenient. The people that say they don't trust them, they have stability issues. So Darren said that for the people that don't trust them, the initial release, they had some stability issues, but those have been fixed in uh, latest uh, releases. Not everything. I, not everything has been fixed, but I would never claim that. He will never claim that Darren is saying that. I've seen issues with it in 2013, probably 2013 SP1, but they're they're much more infrequent than they used to be. So the, there's another chime in from right now. I is install F3 patch for SP1. For SP1. I'm at F4. Maybe it, happen, maybe it happened. Prior, maybe it did happen prior to F4. I'm not sure. Nate, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, how do you uh, consider the use of these when you're doing a um, object-based message, message architecture such as um, Active Framework or something like that? Because in those areas, I find that using the, um, the property node to construct the data in the message and send it since you, you, you are usually doing that outside of the message class itself and then um, accessing um, the, uh, the um, actors' um, private data inside, say, a GUI or something like that, and being able to populate initialization values and such, or be mm -hmm. able to share GUI control, say, give the actor the ability to um, send an event to an event structure or something like that, you end up finding this is a very useful way to do it, and I'm just wondering what your feelings are on that. Oh, I think you bring up an excellent point that when your object, when, when your class is essentially just serving as a transport mechanism, then... I can see why you want to make it really easy to, you know, push data in and pull data out. So that's good. Um, all right. So moving on, I th I think it was Norm that said this. I couldn't. I don't, I don't remember. Um, talking about DVRs. So here I have a method that returns a DVR, and um, one way to go about this is to, you know, index uh, dereference the DVR, and then you, you can use property nodes or call the the methods directly. Um, but you can omit this whole IPE if you just use the property node on the DVR itself. And I think this is cool. Um, I take advantage of this all the time. It's, but uh, again, I think that it encourages bad practice. It's so easy that you end up creating more properties than you really need just for the sake of taking advantage of this convenience. Uh, whereas, again, it might. It, probably makes more sense to create a real proper method that um, you know does checking, does fan, uh, whatever, at least gives you a placeholder for, um, for putting extra logic in. Um, it's not a one-to-one, -one and the data type can change if you needed to. Um, so again, I think this breaks encapsulation. And when people start to use um, a, a chain of property nodes, and especially when they start inserting methods, now you introduce an opportunity for race conditions. Um, I know that uh, Stephen and I have talked about this quite a bit. You know, these two things look exactly, well, look very similar, but they behave differently. And I'm sure you can all figure out that there is an opportunity here after the properties have finished executing that some other process might lock that DVR, change these values, release the DVR, and then when you finally get around to locking it again, method A is now operating on a different, or I'm sorry, method one is now operating on a, on a different set of values than what the author of this code intended. 
so again it just it's it just sets up and the, the possibility of of uh, unintended things to happen but i like the convenience of being able to call methods on dvr so much that i'm still in favor of it so shame on me but uh, i think that we could all benefit from that and so our next survey question is, would you like to be able to do the same thing? Would you like to be able to call methods on DVRs? And um, I have two different yes questions here, because to me, it seems like it should also be possible. Um, you know, LabVIEW would probably implement one way or the other. I don't think it would be an option. But to be able to dispatch on the DVR type without actually locking it. And I don't know about you, but drawing IPEs is very tedious. Every time I have to draw a new one, it frustrates me. I have a merge VI that I drop down to get the basic stuff there, but still have to grow it and resize it and stuff. And IPEs are frustrating. What was that? What was the question? I have a scripting VI that will rep wrap dynamic dispatch call. So Charles uh, is saying that he has a scripting BI that would do you reference the uh, do the rev wrapper. So and you're gonna share that with the meeting right afterwards. It'll be tomorrow. Yeah, he'll add it to the meeting. That does sound like useful scripting. Nate. All right. Go ahead. I don't want to steamroll the discussion to tell me to stop it once, but I'm still I'm still getting hung up. Because you, you were making recommendations, there are people on the phone too that we can't talk to afterwards, uh, specifically about saying that you are breaking encapsulation by giving access to things that people need to write to an API. Be it in the reference scenario or the non-reference scenario, if you're giving a call for somebody to write a string or a number to a class, that class is effectively an API. And if you're giving, if somebody needs to write 3.14 or a string to your API, I don't understand how that is breaking encapsulation because they need to write the data to your API anyway. So what's the, what is the encapsulation breakage that we're getting from that? I'm, I'm possibly misunderstanding. I have another slide that talks about initializers and that I, I think that more often than not, we are doing that that writing to those private data members up front once, and then we send it to the destination or whatnot. So I, I think that a lot of those uh, property nodes should really be uh, parameters to an initializer. And you have to ask yourself the question, after I've initialized this object, do I really need to give the user the ability to change that again later? And if the answer is yes, and if you can be very highly certain that um, that there's unlikely ever going to be a need to change um, the implementation of that, then accessor methods are, are fine. Um, I think that it would be one step better to create a method and not call it as a property and, and make it obvious that this is a method um, so that you uh, you can maintain that encapsulation and give yourself the the room to implement additional stuff later because of that gentleman's agreement. Also, when you start using property nodes, um, you know every uh, accessor method that that you call as a property can only have one input. Um, when you instead use a real, a true method call, you know now you can start to have multiple inputs, and what you actually store may be the you know the calculation on those inputs or you know some decimation of those inputs you know so it doesn't have to you're not saying that this is always going to be a one to one does that answer your question at all norm just thinking just thinking move on <laughs> all right so here's initializer methods and this is kind of the where it gets real world for me um, there were several times when um, I saw code where people were just using write accessors in a property node to initialize an object 
rather than calling a true initializer method. Um, and that's tempting because, again, it may require uh, either a long string of accessor methods or if they're not using the property node form, or may require an initializer method that has a, a bunch of inputs. Um, and of course, it's, uh, it's desirable in that the property node format allows you to set data within the parent um, very easily. But I still think that initializer method for every class is the right way to go. Um, again, it allows you to perform that sanity check when you're initializing the object. Um, it helps, the main thing for me is that it helps ensure that all the data that's required is provided. So, you know, you can use the required input terminals on that initializer method to make sure that, you know, whoever uses your class is providing all the data and they didn't forget to wire some property or, you know, uh, expand the property node, select the right property and then wire it. Um, and then it, it helps future-proof you so that if you do modify your uh, parent class in the future, and, and let's say you have to add some new required attribute, you have a way to break your callers so that they know that they have to supply that new information. Um, so this is what I just said in pictures. Uh, we have a class A, what we've been looking at with the string in numeric, and a class B that adds a Boolean. Both of them have initializer methods, but for some reason, this person decided not to use them. Um, they wrote their own class B. They expanded a property node and wired up all the data, and they start using their object. They're happy. Um, what if someone else, maybe the original author, needs to go insert a new uh, level, in, a new tier into the class hierarchy? So now there's an A.5, if that makes sense. Um, there's no way, if they've done either of these methods shown here, that the that the 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 caller or the end user knows that they need to initialize new data. So in this example, at least we have the option of putting required input terminals on class A and class B, but it still doesn't protect against all scenarios. So my proposal is that the leaf classes should always be responsible for initializing or at least calling the initializers, um, that's really the right way to say it, calling the initializers of its parent, and the parent calls its parent initializer. And this is not anything that's um, revolutionary or new. Um, Mikhail taught me this you know, back in 8.6 in the LabVIEW class. And, uh, but, I don't, but there's plenty of times I don't see it done that way. And so this is just an example of, okay, I added a new required input on class A, and that appropriately breaks class B. Now there may be times, and hopefully there's lots of times, when I don't have to change the API to class A, and maybe I can you know, sufficiently run with the default or auto-determine or look up some configuration data or whatever, and I don't have to require that input, but there's gonna be times when there's just new functionality and you, you need to break callers so that they know that they need to provide it or else maybe something won't work correctly. So you're basically making it a requirement. Uh, you're making the the inputs required by making them required on the parent initialized. Right. And okay. what's your good. default value for the parent information though? Did you hear the question? What is the statement on default values for the parent information? And we need to we we have like five more minutes. Okay. I didn't understand the question, but we'll move on. <laughs> All right, so this is my takeaway. Two slides of this is what I would advocate in user group meetings and my you know, teams that I work with. Um, data should stay in the class whenever possible. You know, Don't even create an accessor method unless you need to for some reason. And maybe that's a, a valid part of your API, like Norm was saying. I believe it was Norm. Um, allow the object to do the work for you. you know, create methods that operate on it. Favor methods over accessors gives you better access control and, and abstraction that encap and it preserves that encapsulation. Think especially hard before creating any public write accessors. I don't mind so much creating public read accessors because they can't actually, you know, modify the object. But you know, should someone ever really need to set this value after this object has been initialized, or should they ever need to set it outside of a proper method call? 
Um, I think that bundle nodes, uh, I don't think there's anything bad about bundle nodes and it re reduces VI count. Um, if you're going to create accessor methods for the purposes that, that Fabiola described, I think that's fine as long as you make them private or protected. Or as John said, you know, public might be a good idea for transport methods. For initializer methods, uh, or for initializing an object, I, I think that initializer methods are the way to go, not using properties. And to say that more generically, um, for calling methods, don't rely on previous property sets to uh, retain your values. Maybe you can do that if it's purely by value, um, but I think the connector panes uh, and just passing parameters the old school way is the best way to do that. So again, consider making accessors protected so that only child classes can call your accessors. I think that's a very underutilized feature. Um, I don't think I've ever seen any other code that's done that other than the code that I've done it in, but I, I haven't been around. I'm not a consultant, so I don't see everybody's code. I think the only problem with there is when you start uh, building executables and trans moving things to uh, real time, sometimes the protect protected class um, doesn't work. So hmm. there, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to do a search on the on the car for that. But that's one reason why when I when I've been looking at code from other people, they end up either doing private or public and never protected. Okay. I'll, I wasn't I'll aware of that. I'll, yeah, I'll search it and add it to the meeting discussion. So I have some suggested naming conventions that I think help um, the user of the class distinguish, you know, the purpose of the method. So read right at the beginning of the, of the method name, you know, that comes from the tool. That's obviously an accessor, and that's where I kind of start to cue off that this is an auto-generated thing. It probably should not have any other code in it. Um, get and set, I think, are the Suitable replacement for read and write. It's like um, it's a method that has the same behavior as accessors typically, but it it doesn't um, tie your hands. Um, it doesn't require that uh, you can only have one input, and allows you to add multiple, you know, more code in in the future. For for true methods, of course, they can be named anything. Find, look up, store, anything that operates on the data. Um, for by-value classes, this is a little bit off topic, but similar enough that I wanted to put in here. Um, I standardize on init or initialize in the method name for a constructor, something that initializes the object, and destructor to clear it. To distinguish for by-reference classes, um, you know, I like to use create and destroy. Um, it just has that connotation of, hey, there's some references being created. And then also, anytime you create a reference class, I think that, or a class that has references in it, I think that uh, you also need to provide a clone method to do a deep copy of that to create a you know a new instance of that object, and an is equal operator to to do a deep comparison to make sure that if you if you needed to compare these two things that whether they're the same or not, because neither of those things you get for free in LabVIEW like you do with the bival class. All right, so. Um, We'll spend a couple minutes in, or a couple seconds on this. Do you have any conventions that you use to help other people understand how to use your classes property properly? <clears throat> have you considered that that the class, the method names, can uh, inform how your class should be used? Okay, good enough for me. Glad to hear it. Um, documentation is always a challenge, but the bigger the team is, um, it's good for onboarding. Um, getting very close to the end here. Thoughts about references and classes. Again, this is a huge topic. Um, some of it is tangential, so I wanted to put it in here or close related. Um, storing a reference in an object is risky because you uh, for several reasons. Um, for one, you know, li the LabVIEW lifetime model for references means that um, that reference may be destroyed whenever the thing that created it stops, or some parallel process could decide to 
improperly destroy the reference that you're using and you wouldn't know about it, you know, you being the object that is depending on that reference. So that's like the worst case scenario of breaking encapsulation, right? Not, a, not only have they changed your value, but they've now actually broken you and you can no longer use yourself. You can no longer use the data that you expected to be able to use. Um, and then it, it, you know, it can be updated anytime outside of your normal methods. Um, hey, can you be a little bit more clear about your thought of what an actual reference is? Are you talking any reference or are you just talking about a chunk of data in a DVR? Right, there's some references that you can't really avoid having in a class, you know, like file references, TCP references or whatever. And I'm just saying be careful about uh, what you make available uh, through accessors and um, whether or not you need to provide additional functionality such as cloning and copy constructor or um, comparison and that kind of stuff. And being aware of, you know, the, the life's the life cycle of, of when that reference was created and when it might be destroyed. And part of the reason that it's uh, more risky is because it's not obvious to the user from the outside unless they open your CTL file and start digging down into your data structures um, that it is by reference. So if it looks like it's by value from the outside, then it would be convenient you know, if it really was by value. Um, otherwise, you need to help your user understand that um, this this object needs to be treated in special ways. So just as I harped on uh, write accessors in a by value context uh, earlier, I think a read accessor that returns a reference is really the most dangerous that you need to be aware of. Again, for the reason I stated earlier, someone can uh, write a value into you uh, at any time, or they can close your reference. So use caution. I realize that there's good reasons for all of these things. Um, I, I'm not saying I never do any of these things or that you shouldn't do any of these things. I'm just saying that they need to be by design and they shouldn't be our de facto standard. Uh, and if you do do these things, then somehow you need to communicate that to your users. All right, now we need we need to wrap it up, uh, Nate. OK, this is, actually the, last, this okay. is actually the last slide. All right. So other than your your like required referential things like your file and TCP and stuff, do you yourself put things like notifiers or DVRs inside of your objects? And if your object is, you know, uh, an actor of some type, then I'm obviously not talking about your communication mechanism either. You know, if you need a queue to get data into your 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 actor, then that's a, a transport mechanism like we talked about earlier. Okay, that's pretty evenly split. Um, for those of you who say frequently, I'd like to ask, I know this is not a very good forum for feedback, but I'd like to ask for those who said frequently, is any of the information here food for thought? Is it something that, you know, maybe I shouldn't put more thought into that? Well, you corrected the question after I had already answered when you said that messaging was okay. That's what I use. That, that's why I put frequently because I wrap a lot of messaging in it. So, but I already answered. Did anybody else? Well, yeah, back there also Charles did the same thing. Good for thought to think of how you're actually using that in your code. So Norm, Norm yeah. said he's about, yeah. And that's really the point of this, is just to have people step back and think about what encapsulation is and whether they're preserving that, because I've, I've just seen a lot of code where it's uh, very easy to select a bunch of um, private data and make them you know, public accessors, and I think that kind of shoots you in the foot early on. Actually, the, the problem is, is that you probably won't realize that it shot you in the foot until much later. All right, well, that's all I had to say. I'd be happy to con continue this conversation more offline sometime. You know how to find me. So thanks for listening, and I hope you found it useful. Thank you, Nate, and go ahead. <laughs> we'll, add the, um, we'll add the video at the document, but if you can add your slides, that will be great. Everybody Absolutely. Has
Thank you so much, Nate. All okay. right. So for open uh, mic, we had uh, Mitchell. Yeah, Blake. Blake. Blake Mitchell. Uh, so can you can you use your computer? He's gonna remote that stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Charles, can you make uh, Aaron's uh, computer the presenter? You're gonna get uh, okay. Ten minutes. Yeah, I'll keep it. I'll keep it brief. Thank you. Yeah, you need oh, to okay. And I'm not. I'm a contractor, so I'm, my machine doesn't natively log in as part of the domain. So you'll have to do AMER slash your name. Oh, and the user? Yeah. 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 Oops. <laughs> I hit the wrong key. I hope you have that key cache. Hey, you still the phone? Software. Where's the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Um, I'll make this pretty brief, um, about 10 minutes or so. So my name is uh, Blake Mitchell. I work here at NI. Um, just found out about this meeting a couple days ago, but I'm glad I came to it. Um, I think the presentation has been great. Um, the data accessor thing I've been thinking about a lot. I still haven't nailed my personal process about how to handle those. And uh, so thank you. <laughs> um, so a little background on me. I've been at NI a little over two and a half years. I dropped out of a PhD program in math came back to work for NI. I originally interned with NI, and so that's how I had the relationship. And since then, I've been, I mainly work in LabVIEW and Test Stand. Uh, my group here at NI, we're an internal group, and so we internally test our products at a system level. So almost all of the work I do is at a system level. When I mean system, I mean at the minimum of a chassis <coughs> and modules, and then we also have labs with uh, I, I've kind of lost count. I think we have maybe uh, 40 or 50 CREOs and then about uh, 20 or so PXI systems um, in one lab. And then we have uh, multiple other PXI systems that do various levels of uh, integration testing and system level testing for our products. So we have no products that are external to NI, but uh, we're more of a services group internal to NI. And so the thing that I wanted to talk about um, First, I have two libraries I'd like to just briefly show, just more of a demo. And if you have more information, feel free to contact me at this email address. Um, these are two libraries I'd eventually potentially like to make available um, to the public. Um, they're currently distributed internally within our group through um, VI packages using the JKI VI tester, or sorry. The yeah, IPM. Yeah, <laughs> the package manager. Um, so the first thing I wanted to demo um, is um, Sort of UI behavior, and I think it's something that almost everybody who's done Labview has probably at some point messed around with the multi-column list box. So um, Labview programming and UI is okay. Um, it can be a little hectic. Uh, let me stop this over here. Um, so let me just show you the behavior real quick. Uh, so as I select on the uh, different things, I, I'm checking them. So that behavior is whenever I click on the row, but this basically acts as a checkbox behavior. And you'll see in the, so on the top right, that's showing which ones are checked. So you'll see that will disappear from the list. And on the bottom right, that show which one is currently selected. And as the, the current default behavior is to allow checking on the, the actual item, not just the checkbox. And there's also behavior of dragging and dropping. Um, so that's not all that complicated. Uh, that's sort of default behavior within the uh, multi-column list box in LabVIEW. So let's take a look at the code here. Um, so there's almost nothing going on. Uh, there's some initialization code going. So this is just uh, me just putting in some dummy parameters in a class. And you'll see here that I'm casting this to a list box class, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. 
Um, here you're just setting some properties, very similar to how you do normal lab UI programming. At the very beginning of your producer-consumer loop, you have some initialization code where you set some properties that you always want for your UI controls. And then here, this is just a dummy loop that I'm reading. So this is showing you which items are checked, and this is showing you which item is selected. And all I'm doing is calling these are property nodes or method nodes on my control. And so you'll notice a kind of a strange thing maybe is that uh, this control is actually, its value is an array of these ListBox class. So what I did is I created an X control that contains LabVIEW objects because it's very annoying. Um, I, I didn't have time to create a VI that kind of showcases this, but oftentimes if you're wanting to display LabVIEW objects in a UI, what you normally have to do is in your consumer loop, keep a shift register of that object. When it comes time to display that object in your UI, the multi-column list box, you convert that array of objects into an array of, a 2D array of strings. That populates the list box. Then when it comes time to make some sort of judgment about which objects are selected on that UI control, you then have to take that 2D array of strings and match that back up with your array of objects that's floating around in your shift register. So there's a conversion process to get the objects from the array of objects to a 2D string. You then have to take the, sorry, the 2D array of string. And you take that from the multi-column list box and convert it back to your object. So it's sort of a wonky process. You have to do that for every single thing that you want to display in a multi-column list box. So what I did is I created an X control and the sort of development method and getting that integrated into your system is that it's installed by a by a BI package, it's installed to the user lib. And so what comes with that is really two things. You get an X control and you get a a class. And if we look at that class, the only method I've currently defined is a display method. So to get your object to display in this X control is you so this is a class that I've defined with some, and I'm uh, breaking uh, <laughs> the rules that may uh, describe, but this is for a demo. Um, so this is a very basic class with just some data types. And I have overridden the multi-column list box object, the display method. And all that does is say, this is how I want my data to be displayed. And so that outputs a 2D array of strings. So it's very simple for this. Um, I, again, and I'm using the property notes, but uh, it's for simplicity. So it's very simple. This is what you end up doing anyways, but now you don't have to keep track of the objects. The objects are actually contained in the control. So it becomes very simple that when you want to get all the checked items, you just call the checked item method. And so these are custom methods we've defined, uh, selected items, some other ones that duplicate some of the um, built-in controls. So what is the data type of the X control? It is an array of LabVIEW objects. Labview object. So the way to initialize it is that whenever you pass in these objects into the X control, that generates a value change on the X control, which then populates. It calls the display method that you've implemented, and then it displays them into the control. Mm -hmm. So I can show that just very quick. Uh, I don't have time to go into the details of an X control. If you've ever done one, it's not fun. Uh, I really <laughs> don't want to. Do them, if you want to do them with causes, it's even less fun. <laughs> yeah, so we're still working on this. We implemented, I created this maybe a, over a couple period of days, and then a fellow developer, uh, Clay Barbie, he's a senior systems engineer here. And when I say systems engineer, we're not in the systems engineering group. Uh, we're systems engineers uh, within R&D. So mm -hmm. there's a slight separation in terms of uh, what we do. Um, so let me just show you real quick here. So this is the actual X control object. In there, there these are all the properties we've defined. The unfortunate thing is you get none of the properties for free. So whenever you have a system multi-column list box that has a lot of properties built into LabVIEW, you get none of those, even if you're only implementing an X control, which wraps only one of those controls. So you have to um, recreate all of those properties. In fact, if you look into most of these, um, you'll find I'm simply uh, calling the reference. Maybe 
is a good one. In fact, this is a bad idea. Um, this is something I picked on when I initially created these because um, when controls get loaded into LabVIEW and then you save that VI and you set some maybe default properties or values in that control, you save the VI and close it, those properties and values are saved with the VI. That's very similar to X controls. They actually do that. However, because I am utilizing these references, um, that data is actually not getting saved with the control. So I was being lazy because I did not want to go through the multi-column list box and add every single um, property value to this cluster being passed around. But in reality, I will end up going back and doing that so that you get sort of the default behavior that you expect. Yeah. A quick note because anybody that uses a control that they want to use properties of that control or right click context menu. There are a few APIs that exist out in the wild for harvesting properties of common lab you control. Okay. And so you're embedding a control inside an X, like a graph, a graph inside of an X control is possibly one of the worst things you can do. There's so many damn properties. Right. But those APIs that exist out in the wild for harvesting properties of things like graphs and stuff, dumping them out to disk, and then regurgitating and reapplying them can help save your sanity when trying to do things yeah. like this, where you're like, oh, I'm going to edit I'm going to change a bunch of properties that I like. Yeah, Ravi, okay. Ravi from the audience is saying you need to distinguish between the persistent and the non-persistent data of an X control. Yeah, okay, so I can uh, talk about that right now. So let me uh, call the <coughs> UI because it's, uh, sorry if I'm going just a little bit over. <laughs> Give me just a few more minutes and then I'll get to it. Uh, so the X control has a bunch of abilities and all of these there are in it that does some initialization where you want to basically have version control. You convert from a pre previous version. You initialize some references, um, and then there's an uninit. So this gets called whenever the uh, X control gets closed out of memory. Uh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Uh, I should have picked the one that's named uh, fairly well. So this is convert uh, state for save. So as you see, there's very little we're saving actually. Um, well, we're actually saving all of the data that's inside the cluster, but because I'm piggybacking on that reference, I'm not getting all of the properties that you'd expect. Uh, but the ones that we have manually defined inside this cluster, uh, we're getting saved. And then we're kind of getting some final calculation on what the column width was so that whenever you move the column width, you don't want to readjust that every time you open the, the X control. Um, so this is, this is the VI where you can determine what you really want to save when the VI um, exits. Uh, so I guess that's all I'll show. Uh, maybe just real quick, the facade VI is what actually does all the work. So this is an event structure like you do most of your UI. Uh, this is maybe the worst one to open up on. This is the what Clay Barbie did. Um, he did all the implementation for the drag and drop behavior. Um, it was not fun, and uh, you can see uh, I won't open up these VIs. Uh, there's a lot of pixel calculations. Lab is uh, a little. It's very difficult because, like I said, you're not inheriting any of the properties of the multi-column list box. You're basically reproducing all of the behavior that that control does. However, the benefit of doing this X control is that you do it once, it's hard, you forget about it, and then now this thing can be easily reused. Um, so basically, I was going to show you the uh, data change. Uh, so basically, whenever the... Uh, yep, yeah, so whenever the data changes of the Xbox, the X control, basically when I pass that array into the control terminal, it calls the data change event. The SOD VI runs the data change event, and in that, that's where we update the value. So you see here, this is actually calling the display method. Um, and just to show you how powerful this is, even though we, we need some more work to finish it off with the things we learned as we went through this, Clay and I did, um, but to show you the power of this, um, all you got to do is drag these two things. You got to drag this to your front panel. So uh, let me open back up the uh, the demo. So to get one of these in there, you just uh, drag it into your front panel, and that's it. 
the next thing you do is you, you need the object in your project so that you can inherit from it. You change this object to inherit from this object, and then you implement the sysbox display method. Uh, we haven't had a whole lot of time to, of course, we do this sort of level of uh, development. You only do what you sort of need. So it still needs some work of implementing all the properties and methods. Um, it would be nice to add some uh, overriding uh, sorting to be able to sort uh, by columns and things like that. But to kind of uh, reiterate the power of this, here's a UI that we wrote in LabVIEW. Um, each multi-column list box you see here, even those, those are only single column, it's really the multi-column list box. So each one of these is the X control that I just made. So it's the same X control, it's the exact same code that's installed to your user lib, and each one of these is displaying a different object. In this case, we're displaying a software stack object. That's different from this, which are installer's objects. And then over here, this is actually, so as uh, wrong, two out of the three are unique. This is displaying uh, software stacks as well. So there's a, and this is just kind of a brief overview. This is sort of an iTunes or Amazon music player of configuring automated installers where we want to configure software stacks that run a certain amount of installers. So uh, that's sort of the power of this. And in fact, this is used in another UI that we created which actually was developed by another developer on my team, which, uh, oops, sorry. I gotta select one of these to get to the next screen. So once you do that, this is yet another object using the exact same code. There's no code duplication other than all of the code saved in the user lib uh, that you're inheriting from this X control. So it's really a beautiful use case in showing the reusability aspects of this because as we found bugs and things we needed to add features to the X control, we fixed it in one place, deployed a new project, everybody just updates their, sorry, new package, BI package. Everybody gets the update and you automatically get the features uh, on your UI. And so this one utilizes the checkbox behavior, which is uh, sort of nice to get. And these are objects again. So the code underneath these UIs is extremely simple. There's no, almost no UI handling of this. All you're doing is just getting what you expected. In the case of the bigger UI, you're getting this selected object. Here, you're just getting the uh, checked object. And we have the ability where you can replace the uh, checked glyphs. We use the word checked, but you can pick whatever uh, picture you want. In there. So I had another. You uh, I'll leave that alone. I, I think I think I mean I think a lot of people probably if you guys want to see more let me know and maybe you come back later and present. Yeah, uh, sure, I can do that another time. Or if if you want to contact me, just feel free to email me. Um, I would like to eventually move these to the public. Uh, the other library I have is to manage RT systems, so it encapsulates system configuration, uh, FTP, and web dot web dev. And it allows you to easily switch between the two um, using an interface between the two uh, file transfer protocols. And then it encapsulates a lot of the stuff you have to know about system configuration in which you're just wanting to do things like install, format, and restart. And like I said, we do a lot of systems. So the library is made to take in all of the quirks of our different product groups like Parlap VX works, and even the quirks between those um, because they all handle the protocols and system config a little differently. So feel free to contact me if you want to learn more about that. That's all I have. So any questions? Or? If anybody has done X controls in classes, I mean. <laughs> it's really not the <laughs> most complicated thing. The, I mean, the idea generation was the big thing. Once to implement it was fairly simple. Learning about the X control was much more difficult. And I would highly recommend using the desktop trace execution toolkit because as you see here, it's telling you exactly when it's calling the different ability BIs. And that's particularly useful when the X control emits. So you see here, that's when I close the VI um, containing the X control. So that's very helpful in understanding when things are getting called as you're doing different things with the X control. So, all right, that's all I have to uh, say. Clay did all the hard work on doing the uh, drag and drop. I don't think I would have had the uh, patience to uh, do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.
you guys, uh, let me know what you want to see for future presentations you want to present. Uh, thank you for people that joined remotely. Send me an email if you have any tips, uh, feedback, complaints, requests. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.